All right, uh, sorry for, okay, let's go around. Um, yeah, sorry for the late start. Uh, okay, so, so, so let's, let's, um, let's move on. Uh, the, mm, so the topic today is long-lived extinctions, their dynamics and their contribution to, to, to hydrodynamics and all the things that we discussed yesterday. Uh, I mean, the way it started is that we, you know, we did what I talked about yesterday and uh, then um, once it was clear that there is, a, you know, there is an interesting hydrodynamic regime, we decided we'll, we'll try to compute, compute viscosity uh, of, uh, of the electron system. And then uh, when we started thinking about viscosity, we realized that uh, there is something uh, deeper that needs to be clarified about uh, how uh, electrons in two dimensions, uh, how quasi-particles in a two-dimensional Fermi liquid uh, scatter and how they contribute to hydrodynamic uh, be behavior. Uh, and so I will start with <coughs> reminding uh, 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 ourselves what I'm sure uh, we know already, but just to make sure we're on the same page, uh, Landau Fermi liquid theory. So Landau, uh, you know, considered strongly interacting fermions uh, and, and and, and uh, at degeneracy, but at strong interaction, uh, it seems to be a challenging problem because the interaction is a order of kinetic energy, order, order of the Fermi energy, everything is of the same order, and so it's not clear how to handle that. Uh, however, you know, the, 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 the idea was that actually uh, because of fermion exclusion, because fermions, uh, fermions, uh, feel mainly the states which are deep below the Fermi energy and the states which are near the Fermi energy is a small, a small subset. Uh, that m makes you know, the problem uh, tractable and the behavior, behavior simple even though it's a strong, nominally it's a strongly interacting problem with kinetic energy and potential energy being of the same, of the same size. Uh, and uh, So the picture is that, you know, th there is a field Fermi C and then all the action is happening near the Fermi level uh, in, in a band of states of water, of water uh, th thermal energy and the states, states beneath a field and are just spectators for what, what uh, what's happening near the Fermi level. Uh, that, 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 that's, the, uh, that's the idea and uh, then the, the particles near the Fermi level, they have to be understood as quasi-particles because each, each particle is dressed by, uh, by polarization uh, in the Fermi C and by, uh, by, by the flow that particles, um, by, by wake uh, that particles uh, in the f deep in the Fermi C provide when particle near the Fermi level is moving. Uh, so there is this picture you know, of, of, of a quasi-particle that comes with it. And then these quasi-particles, once properly defined, become, uh, become long-lived. They have relatively long times as compared to, you know, what I would estimate naively based on, you know, Heisenberg uncertainty, taking H bar divided by kinetic energy, H bar of Fermi energy would give me a very short lifetime. And then in, in the Fermi liquid, it is much, uh, much longer and uh, the lifetime goes inversely with, uh, with goes inversely with temperature squared. And uh, so that, 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 that's the basis, right? Um, and pictorially, I mean, pictorially, that's how textbooks describe it. You, uh, you start with particle and then, you know, after it's being dressed by interactions, it becomes a quasi-particle. Uh, and uh, quasi-particles quasi -particles acquire, you know, new mass, acquire uh, new uh, quantum numbers and uh, and new 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 lifetime become long become long lived and so we will be will be interested in uh, in the lifetime today 
Uh, now, the argument, Landau argument for a lifetime was, you know, ag again, repeating the textbook, uh, the textbook uh, um, um, stuff, um, was the phase space argument. If you have a particle uh, excited above the Fermi level and it interacts with other particles in the system, then in order to get rid of its energy, it has to excite particle hole pair uh, across, across the Fermi level. And then it, th that means that if I'm you know, thinking about the rate, it has to divide its energy into three, uh, three, three parts for, 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 the new, uh, for the energy of the new, uh, for the new energy of the particle and uh, the particle hole excitation. And then if you go through that phase volume argument, pictorially you can say that uh, th that's your, mm, so that's your particle hole, particle hole pair. And if you are thinking about the phase space, you see that uh, the phase volume for, for the pair is proportional to the energy of the pair. And now if you, have, if you have the energy of the particle, you have to divide that between uh, the new particle energy and the particle hole energy. Uh, then that means that you have to uh, take that energy and write it as a sum of, of something and something else, and that something else comes with a weight epsilon. And then if you, if you write down a delta function saying that you know, some of the two things weighted with epsilon uh, give, give that total energy, you get, uh, b by a simple argument, you get, get epsilon square, and that, that, that's how it, uh, how it works, all right? Uh, so, so in this argument, uh, we don't worry about momentum conservation. Uh, even though in the Fermi liquid, particularly in the Fermi liquid that L Landau was thinking about in helium-3, uh, momentum is conserved. Um, however, uh, the argument doesn't depend on it. Uh, the, the phase space argument doesn't depend on it. And this is so because in, uh, in three dimensions, uh, momentum conservation does not pose a bottleneck because three particles, sorry, two, two particles two particles with uh, momenta uh, arranged in a generic way, they can scatter, uh, they can scatter preserving total momentum. And in, in that process, they can, uh, they can scatter by large angles as, as, uh, as this picture illustrates. Uh, and uh, so momentum conservation does not, you know, does not, does not pose any obstacle, any ch change the prefactor in the calculation on the, on the previous page, but not, uh, does not change the scaling argument, right? Uh, and so, so everything, everything is, is uh, everything is good in 3D. And then when you start thinking about what happens in 2D, you discover that in 2D momentum conservation does matter simply because if you if you think again about two particles uh, with momenta at a generic angle, uh, and now they are in 2D, you cannot. I mean, you cannot do this. You cannot rotate them out of the 2D plane, right? Uh, so, so in 2D, uh, in 2D, uh, the angular, uh, the momentum conservation will uh, will present a bottleneck for angular relaxation, and some some revision of Fermi liquid theory will be will be required, uh, and so that's what I will talk about first, and then and then discuss how that how that impacts the hydro dynamics. Um, any, any questions so far? Okay. Um. Th th this is this is you. This is you. Oh, oh, you mean on the first page? So, so th this was Fermi and Landau, because Land Landau for Fermi liquid. Of, of, of not with me, but I mean, I, I, I've seen that, but. Uh, um, right. Uh, so, uh, okay, so maybe, I mean, because this is a school and because there are quasi-particles in, in the subject and also because uh, when, you teach, when you teach it, as I often do, students always ask, you know, why, 
why there are these funny names, why phonons are collective excitations and why spin waves are elementary excitations and why uh, something else is a quasi-particle, even though they all look like you know, similar entities. Uh, so when I got this question first, I think about four years ago, uh, and Flint may even be in the audience somewhere, but, uh, but uh, I, I talked to a friend who is a historian of science and is interested, one of his interests in is the history of the concept of quasi-particles and he wrote interesting, uh, interesting um, essays on that. Uh, and so what he was telling me was that uh, it's all historical, it's how the, com how the naming developed historically. Quasi-particles emerged in, uh, first quasi-particles, phonons, emerged in 1930s and in 1930s the uh, prevalent political view was uh, that people believed in collectivism. And uh, because of that, this collectivistic, collectivist terminology penetrated the subject and um, we all till this day speak, uh, speak that language. I mean, we talk about collective excitations, collective phenomena, collective coordinates, collective modes, collective something else. I mean, we can, can keep going, right? And uh, indeed, I mean, the first quasi-particle introduced phonons. I mean, it's a perfect example of collectivist behavior because there are atoms which are stationary, pinned to their uh, lattice positions, but, but interacting with each other allows them to transport energy, transport momentum, and uh, behave as if you know, energy and momentum are freely moving, and uh, together they can accomplish that, and in individually they cannot, right? So that, uh, that, 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 that was perfect. Uh, but then, I mean, then uh, uh, things evolved and um, uh, the world evolved and thinking evolved and uh, uh, the terminology evolved with it. And so he, he, he says that uh, one can trace the change in terminology to the change in, to the change in, in, um, in political thinking. So in, uh, you know, in the course of events, I mean, people became less interested in uh, or less uh, trusting in collectivism and, uh, in, and uh, more attracted to the individualist uh, um, point of view. And, uh, and that happened about in different countries at different time, but in, in, uh, on average it happened around 1956. Uh, and uh, that's, that's roughly when, oh, sorry, that, that, that's wrong. So that's, that's, where th that's when Fermi-liquid quasi-particles have been described. Uh, and uh, in, in, in the Fermi-liquid, we have a quasi-particle, which is uh, a, po a particle trying to you know, live in the oppressive environment from you know, taking my friend's historian uh, um, l language. Uh, and in order to survive in the oppressive environment, it has to, you know, has to uh, change the behavior, it has to become different mass, different spin, different um, quantum numbers. Uh, so it has to pay price, but, but it gains longer lifetime, right? Gain longer lifetime, you live longer, right? And so, so that's, that's, uh, that's his, uh, that's his uh, ex explanation. Uh, and uh, now, uh, is there any questions about it? I don't think I can. I can. <coughs> let me. Um, yeah. Yeah, but in one D, I mean, you can. Sure, but it's still. I mean, it's oppressive environment, even more oppressive <laughs> than. Uh, um, so so anyway, so, so let me go back to my. Uh, my my uh, s subject. Uh, so, so to understand better and more, more quantitatively that uh, angular c uh, angular relaxation bottleneck, uh, let me. I mean, may maybe l let me first say that the reason we were interested in the angular relaxation is that angular relaxation uh, is what uh, needs to be understood to determine viscosity because viscosity is the rate at which particles pass momentum to each other, right? And so you need to understand how they scatter on, on a two-dimensional Fermi surface. And, uh, and angular relaxation is the, is, the, is the key, right? So if you start with, uh, with 
two particles without a Fermi C, just two, two free particles in, in free space. Then we know how to solve that. Uh, you just take particle one, particle two, you go to central mass frame, and the central mass frame uh, collision looks like head-on, and it's head-on, energy is conserved, the momentum is conserved because of that it's also head-out. And so from that you, you can, you can uh, infer that uh, the new, new particle states will be somewhere on that, on that circle that, um, that uh, you, you, you uh, make by taking the center of mass uh, as a center, uh, as, as the geometric center of the circle. And then the particle, uh, particle one can go anywhere here, particle two can go anywhere here, so long as they're at the, the opposite points, right? Uh, now, if you do the same thing in the presence of a Fermi C, then uh, you discover that, that all the states within are blocked because there are particles here. Uh, that means that a uh, particle can also, also cannot go here because, uh, because the diametrically opposite states are blocked. So that, that, leaves, that leaves a very small band of, uh, band of states where particles can scatter if they want to, if they want to um, um, do it obeying momentum conservation and power blocking, right? So, so that, uh, that, uh, that allows the angle to change, but only by, by that much, because this band is kT in width and Fermi C is Fermi energy, much greater. Uh, and uh, so, so, so there is a small angle by which particles can scatter. That, that's the only thing they can do. Uh, and, uh, and, and so that, that's, that's, the, uh, th that's the issue in 2D. Uh, so if that was, you know, if it was just that simple, then the conclusion would be that momentum relaxation s is simply so slow that you can ignore it completely. Uh, however, it turns out that in addition to those generic angle processes, which are indeed small angles, uh, there are also processes where, uh, where uh, angular relaxation is, uh, a, a relaxation of the ang angle change by a large amount is allowed. And these are processes when particles collide head-on or nearly head-on. Because then uh, this kinematic circle that we considered will coincide with the Fermi surface or nearly coincide with the Fermi surface. And then, and then uh, if so, then, then particles can scatter by a large angle without violating momentum conservation and power exclusion and obeying all the, uh, all the kinematic constraints. Uh, and uh, so if you calculate the rate, you find that, you know, miraculously this Landauti square uh, in, in scaling s survives. Uh, however, the new, new thing here is that uh, you can see that if you, I mean, if you ask the question, what part of momentum distribution can relax due to, due to uh, head-on collisions, uh, you find that only, only, only a part of it can, can relax. Uh, the even parity distributions can, can relax and the odd parity cannot because if you have, uh, if you have uh, let's say particles here and particles here, then they scatter on each other and, you know, uh, and relax in one collision. But if you have, let's say, particles here and holes here, uh, then these particles have nothing here to scatter on and they cannot scatter on other particles uh, because of that problem we just discussed. So, so you need uh, th this you know, fast, fast uh, Landau-type moment uh, re relaxation uh, will only occur for the even parity part of momentum distribution. And, and the odd parity will not, uh, will not relax so quickly. And so, so there is a, so that poses an interesting question to, to understand the rates at which even and odd parities of, uh, even and odd parts of momentum distribution uh, relax uh, and uh, we look into that, or we looked into that, and uh, found that there is a big, uh, big difference, and the rates for the even parity is Landau, um, sorry, Landau, no, wrong way. Uh, 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 the rate for the even parity is Landau-like, and the rate for the odd parity is uh, down by uh, a large factor compared to compared to that rate. Uh, and that, uh, so that, that's the new and interesting behavior in 2D uh, that makes it different from 3D. Uh, so that, uh, I mean, to conclude this 
introductory um, uh, in discussion, I mean, uh, you can cast everything in the following form. You can say that let me, uh, let me take distributions, uh, you know, we, uh, describe them by deviations of geometry of the Fermi surface uh, away, from, uh, away from circular geometry, and then decompose it into angular momentum harmonics with different, uh, with different uh, angular momenta. Um, and then the odd ones will be long-lived, and then the even ones will be short-lived. Uh, and then, of course, there'll be m equal 1 and m equal 2, which are con uh, m equal 0, which are conserved because of particle conservation and momentum conservation. But, but in addition to those, there will be also very long-lived or parity ones, and there will be very many of them. Right, and so, so these, that's the interesting qu question. I mean, what, what are the rates for these uh, odd parity harmonics and uh, how they contribute to, uh, to uh, transfer? Okay, and so, so I'll, talk, I'll talk about some of that in, in the next half hour, but maybe let, let's see if there are any questions. Yeah, I mean, I, I, I'll, be, I, I'll be mostly concerned with a circle. One can generalize to something like ellipse or something concave, but P to minus P symmetric. Yeah. Convex means this. Yeah, I mean, if it's concave, concave then, then there will be a different story. I mean, y you can ask how what I'm going to talk about will change if you introduce modulation of the Fermi surface and then as a function of the amplitude of that modulation, there will be a change in behavior. There will be some critical. And then the long wave ones will be uh, Okay, I, I'm not sure I am ready to agree with that, but we, we can discuss that. I mean, uh, luckily for for the cases that we're interested in, uh, where hydrodynamics is being studied, graphene, gallium marcinite, and so forth, uh, Fermi surface is pretty much a circle. I mean, there are some deviations, but they're not, uh, they're not so important. So in, in graphene, I mean, speaking of that, in, in graphene, if you look, if you zoom in, you will see that there is a trigonal warping. Trigonal warping is not P to minus P symmetric. So you might say that trigonal warping will kill all of that, but, but the amplitude of trigonal warping at realistic, at realistic dopings is very, very small, so it's, it's not, not, not an issue. But in principle, I mean, if you take graphene, uh, dope, it dope it all the way, you take twisted bilayer graphene, actually that's more, you know, more, more likely because th there you can, you can get into the regime when the Fermi surface shape changes, you know, more drastically, so th there you can you can see new behavior, and maybe uh, maybe people are already seeing it. But l let's not get into that. Um, yeah. This is why I cut off at the very end of how I think the whole thing should be. Uh, it's an interesting question. I mean, I, I I'm not sure I. Yeah, I, I'm not sure lifetime has anything to do with softness of, of the excitation. I mean, Sandranchuk is, is about how soft the smell becomes. So this is not, not about softness, it's about lifetime. Yeah. So it's not, not related. I mean, or maybe it is related, but we don't know how. Uh, okay. But I anyway, so, so what, let me just say a few more words about the big picture. So, uh, so, so what, what emerges from, uh, from this discussion is that, uh, is that, um, um, there is a new hierarchy of length scales and also time scales because in the conventional Fermi literal, like in three-dimensional helium-3, something, something like that, uh, there is a, a ballistic range of length scales, you know, up to one collision. Uh, and then beyond that, uh, there, is a f uh, there is a full uh, memory loss about all quantities that which are not conserved in a single collision, 
and you enter the hydrodynamic regime. Uh, in 2D, it's going to be more interesting because there is, uh, there is ballistic regime, and then once you, you know, once you go beyond uh, the one collision mean free path, the even, even parity modes relax quickly, but the odd parity modes uh, do not. And then there is this regime where, uh, where there are lots of modes which are, which, um, are not relaxing, uh, but it's not ballistic because the, all the even parity modes are, are gone. Uh, and then we have to work out what, you know, what happens in this regime. And uh, in this regime, there is an interesting angular memory, as we'll discuss. Um, and because of that, uh, we use the name tomographic to describe it. Uh, and then uh, there is a length scale, which uh, there is a length scale, which there is a crossover from, from this uh, angular memory regime or tomographic regime to to the conventional hydrodynamic regime, and that, that happens when all, all, all harmonics except m equals zero and m equals one uh, have relaxed. But, but the length scale and the time scale at which, there we go, length scale and time scale at which it happens will be much longer than, uh, than uh, the ballistic to, uh, to uh, <coughs> between the ballistic and this one. Uh, so there is a wide range of times and length scales where, uh, where this is the uh, replacement of hydra. Also, I mean, if you think about experiments, experiments are usually, as we discussed yesterday, I mean, they start at low temperature and then they increase their temperature and uh, as they do so, the mean free path becomes shorter and shorter and eventually it becomes as short as the length scales at which they, which they probe, uh, which are being probed, uh, such as the constriction width or so something like that. And then uh, when that happens, your, I mean, the, uh, the crossover that you observe will not be due to transition from, from here to here. It will be due to even, even harmonics dying out and odd ones surviving. So, 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 so in, in this ballistic to hydra crossover that people usually observe, uh, we think the dominant role is, is, is uh, the interplay between ballistic and this demographic, and then to get into the real hydrodynamic, we need to go to really large length scales or um, really long times, and that, uh, th that may be more challenging now. Uh, so given that, I mean, one can ask, one can pose you know, many, uh, many questions and uh, think, about, uh, think about the uh, long time memory and how to describe it and what is the interplay between these different length scales and time scales and how to, how to draw equations of motion uh, and what will be experimental manifestation. So, so that's what we, we've been working on uh, in, in, the, in the past three years and I'll, and I'll, I'll, I'll talk a little bit about it. Uh, maybe, I mean, before jumping into that, are there any questions so far? Yeah, so F is the distribution, particle distribution and momentum uh, function of position. Um, what's in the Boltzmann equation, basically? Yeah. M more, more questions? Yeah. So, Okay, so, so, so referring to what we discussed yesterday, I mean, uh, ballistic behavior is when all microscopic degrees of freedom um, are relevant. I mean, uh, the hydrodynamic description is when all degrees of freedom, uh, memory about all degrees of freedom, except those which are conserved because of microscopic conservation laws, momentum and energy, for example, uh, are erased. Right, and then uh, and then if we are in a situation that, in addition to those um, guaranteed conserved quantities, there are also some soft modes uh, that are uh, that have long lifetimes, there is a new new intermediate regime. So that that's that's the story. Yeah. <coughs> Yeah. 
Um, no one looked into that. Uh, I, I, don't, I don't think anyone looked into that. Um, but yeah, I think n no one looked into it directly. I mean, I have some indirect knowledge of that, but m maybe let's talk about it later. Mm -hmm. mm, yeah, no, I understand, but I, it's a s relatively small phase space. I mean, I, I looked from that point of view at the old calculation of viscosity that people were doing using three-dimensional Fermi liquids, trying to check if they missed anything, and I, I think they did not. I mean, maybe there are corrections due to, due to small, small, small phase. No, I, I don't think so. I mean, there's pretty good l literature that, that that covers that, and I think it all, all stands. I mean, my, my, my con that was my conclusion. I mean, maybe some small uh, um, corrections that are never was interesting because they're non non analytic or something like that. But I mean, o overall, I think it all all, all is good. Coming, yeah. So it's coming. Um, yeah. So, so let me let me talk let me talk about uh, estimating the rate. So if you, uh, I mean, if you uh, think about the even harmonic lifetimes, then uh, you just need to. I mean, as, as we discussed, you need to consider consider this process uh, and then calculate calculate the rate from that. Um, and then if you and, and then you get get Landau, Landau type scaling. Uh, the prefactor will depend on the interaction strings, but overall it will be pretty much uh, like um, what you would expect. Um, for the odd parity modes, the story is quite a bit more complicated. Uh, and uh, and th there is actually a long paper that we wrote uh, on that uh, where all of that is carefully analyzed. Uh, so, so what I'm going to present I is not a, like a quantitative argument, but m more like a qualitative, uh, qualitative picture. Uh, so first of all, let me, uh, l let me start with th these collisions that we already talked about when two particles collide at a generic angle. Then in this case, uh, the, angle, uh, the angle displacement allowed by conservation laws of power exclusion is, um, is, is of, that, of that scale, so it's small. And one might, you know, one might say that because it's so small, uh, you might think about, you, you, can, you can try to think about angular relaxation in terms of diffusion on the Fermi circuit. You can say that each particle is making a step, a, a step <coughs> steps of this size at every, every collision. And then you have to take collision rate times square of that step, and that will give you diffusivity on the, on the Fermi surface, and then if you and, and 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 then from that you can get um, get a, a, a time scale, uh, how long it will take particle to diffuse over the entire uh, circumference, uh, and then then th that's what you get. The, the collision, uh, the rate at which collision is happening is still t square, and then there is the angular step delta theta, and if you plug this in, you get t to the fourth uh, times m square, the order of the harmonic. M, m square arises because in in the diffusion in the diffusion equation you have uh, you have Laplacian of of the angle uh, and uh, that gives m square and so that that was the initial guess for um, what uh, what to expect uh, but then I mean if you look more closely you you discover that uh, that there are actually uh, contributions giving bigger angular steps for example if you take particles that collide uh, collide, uh, sorry, uh, 
collide near Hedon, then for near Hedon, the angular displacement, uh, you can estimate that goes not linearly in T, but as a square root in temp temperature. And then if you take the square root temperature dependence and put it in this uh, angular diffusion argument, you'll get T, T cube scaling, uh, still M square. Uh, and so that, uh, that, that's something that you want to consider. Uh, however, it turns out that uh, there is an interesting reason why, why this, this, is a, this is not right. It overestimates a relaxation rate by, by a large factor. And the true, uh, the true result is still t square, uh, sorry, still t to the fourth. Uh, however, if you analyze carefully these near head-on processes, you find that, uh, that the dependence on the angular harmonic order is not m to the fourth, but uh, not m square, but m to the fourth. So there's a fourth power of, of m uh, coming up. And th this arises because of an interesting reason. It arises because, uh, because these two body collisions with near head-on, they do lead to big angular displacements, but uh, they're correlated ones. The, the, the angular displacement is roughly of that size, but then both particles make, make these uh, steps um, at, you know, when they collide. And so, so the angular relaxation, you cannot think about as a single particle uh, angular diffusion. You have to think about two particles, uh, two particles doing it, doing it together, da dancing, uh, dancing in lockstep or in anti-lockstep, but making equal angular steps uh, at, each, at each collision. And so that, that turns out to be, as this paper, um, as this paper mm, discusses, that, that that's the dominant contribution, and, and that's where uh, that's where the odd rate, uh, odd m rates, uh, originate. Um, so they are they are due to not due to general general angle collisions, but due to near head-on collisions, and uh, that uh, that leads to. Uh, still t to the fourth scaling, but but different uh, different time dependence. So that, that's that's a quick uh, quick summary of that of that very long paper uh, paper that we wrote. Let, let me I mean given given the time we have, let me not you know go go further into that and just jump jump ahead and discuss other things. But I mean, is there any questions? I mean, let, let's. I doubt. I mean, I uh, let's move on a little bit, and we'll, uh, there are different. So this will lead to different power laws, and I think I am not. Uh, yeah, in, in the bulk unconstrained. Yeah, so let, let, let's not get into that. I mean, let, let, let's move on. Um, So let me, uh, yeah, let, let me skip. I mean, s someone could ask. I mean, if someone would ask, I, I will ha be happy to discuss it. Why, uh, why microscopic calculations based on self energy predict predict t square for the lifetime, and here we have something else. And uh, if, if if anyone is interested, uh, we can discuss it. But let's let's talk afterwards. Um, right. So so let's talk about manifestations. Uh, so if you want to understand uh, how these odd parity modes contribute to transport, uh, you have to, uh, I mean, the easiest way to do it is to take your distribution function and decompose it in the sum of the odd one, uh, odd, odd one and the even one, and then uh, try to derive a closed form relation for the odd parity part. Uh, and uh, then you get something that allows you to calculate conductivity. Uh, and the odd parity part is the one responsible for transport because uh, current, is current due to even parity modes like, like those is zero, and all, uh, only the odd parity modes contribute to, uh, can carry current, right? Uh, so, so the odd parity modes are fully, fully responsible for, for conductivity, and so it's interesting to look into that. 
uh, they will dominate transport and the even parity part will be short-lived. Um, right, and if you want to understand that, so, so I, mean, I would like to, would love to do it on a blackboard, but because it's a whiteboard, I decided I will digitize these equations. Uh, so sorry about that, but there will be, uh, there will be a slide with equations. Uh, you, you, can, uh, you can proceed as follows, you can take uh, you can take uh, the Boltzmann kinetic equation with, uh, with um, uh, this, this being the streaming part and this being the collision part, linearized in distribution function, uh, and then uh, decompose distribution function in the, in the harmonics, and each harmonic will be an eigenfunction of a collision, linearized collision operator with gamma m that we, uh, that we talked about uh, just, a, just a moment ago. Uh, and now um, you want to integrate out the even m modes and derive the closed formulation for the odd m modes. Uh, so you just write f as a sum of the even and odd, plug it in, and then you know separate uh, separate uh, the, the two. And then uh, the uh, in the in the even parity part you can make the diabetic approximation saying that uh, saying that because because there is a faster relatively faster relaxation time for the even parity part is follows the odd parity part. Uh, so you can, uh, uh, you can invert this operator and uh, then plug it in uh, the second equation. And if you do that, uh, if you do that, you get for the odd parity part, you get this interesting equation uh, written here, which, uh, which, which says the following, that it's a one, it's a one dimensional diffusion. Uh, it's a one dimensional diffusion along the velocity direction, which is not changing. Uh, and so, it, you know, zero order. If you don't want to think about this, the, the, the slow, uh, slow relaxation uh, processes due to uh, odd parity harmonics, uh, is just one-dimensional diffusion along the unchanging velocity orientation. Uh, and then, at much longer time scale, there will be uh, a memory loss, and the system will forget about uh, about the uh, velocity orientation, and there will be this term Laplacian. Uh, uh, Square uh, resp responsible for that with the rate, uh, with the rate uh, that goes with t to the fourth. So that that's what you derive from, uh, from that's what this analysis gives, uh, and um, and then using this equation you can you know you can uh, uh, calculate the response and uh, response of current to electric field, uh, and get conductivity and viscosity. And what you find is that conductivity and viscosity, I mean, it's a simple calculation, no time to do it on a, uh, on a blackboard or a whiteboard or on a screen, but it, it's, in, it's in this paper. Uh, then the conductivity and viscosity become, uh, become um, scale dependent. They, in that thermographic regime, uh, viscosity and conductivity is not a number, it's a function of k. Uh, and that means that viscosity will depend on the length scale at which you measure it, and so, so will uh, conductivity. Uh, so your fluid will be, um, you know, like a non-Newtonian fluid. And non-Newtonian means that viscosity depends on the thickness of the layer uh, of the fluid, and so that, that's how uh, that's how this electron uh, 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 electron fluid will behave. Uh, for conductivity, also you get you get um, some power law for k dependence, and then there is a temperature dependence. Uh, complicated temperature dependence coming from gamma and gamma prime. Gamma is t Landau t square and gamma prime is t to the fourth. Uh, so that predicts, uh, Dmitry, uh, I, I think you, you, you asked about it yesterday. So, so, so this will predict conductivity being a linear function of temperature. Um, linear. But I mean, I'm not claiming anything about experiments yet because th this is just a, like, Calculation of a response uh, at finite k, no boundary conditions, just you know, peppered, peppered type non-local response. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, we can relate it for conductivity. Let's say with constriction, I if you take. If you take constriction and say that k k in this equation should be re re replaced by one over the width of the constriction, yeah. So that uh, th that's uh, not yet analyzed. Um, 
Right. So, so anyway, so, so you see it looks interesting. And so, so I think it's interesting to, to discuss the basis, you know, wh wh why, why is there this new, new behavior? Uh, more microscopically. So I, you know, I, I, I told you what, what we find if we do calculation uh, I, 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 studying harmonics, analyzing rates in harmonics, and building, from building uh, transport equations from that. But uh, one can ask a question, what, what, you know, what, what happens on the, on the microscopic level? On the microscopic level, you can understand uh, what's going on if you think about injecting a test beam in your in your system. If you if you take if you take an electron um, source, inject a test particle, uh, then um, um, th that's the distribution that describes it. And you can take this distribution and then decompose it in a statistical mixture of the even part and the odd part, uh, and then this this part will be will be gone quickly after one collision, and then this, this part will, will survive much longer. Uh, and physically or microscopically, what happens is the following, that when you inject a particle, it will collide with ambient particles, but only the ones which are head-on. And then if you have a particle and the head-on ambient particle, they will scatter somewhere and will be, I mean, angles are random, and if you average over random angles, it will be erased. Uh, the memory about the pr everything will be erased, except the fact that now the counter-propagating beam is depleted of particles. So the counter-propagating beam is carrying holes. So you inject a particle and you get a hole coming back because, because your particle scattered on uh, ambient particle in a head-on way and then, then the counter-propagating beam uh, is generated which car carries holes. And then this, this counter-propagating beam carrying holes will propagate back and will be another collision of those holes with ambient holes, and then they will, uh, after head-on process, they will produce you know, a particle that goes back in the forward direction. And so, so that, that's how transport will proceed. So, so, so the, explanation for, uh, the explanation for this diffusion equation that we talked about here is that it describes the switchback processes, particles coming forward, holes backscattered, and then you know, turning back into particles and then into holes. And so it's a one-dimensional diffusion with, I mean, in this approximation, there is no change in orientations or velocities. And, and then on a much longer time scale, there will be, uh, there will be a change of on orientation of velocity, and it will lead to, uh, a, to memory loss. But over, over that time, uh, in between, there will be, there will be an, a, a directional memory that system will, uh, will, will have, right? And so, so that's, that's the microscopic picture. I mean, you can say that, uh, that uh, you, you have a, mm, I mean, this is an example of a, a retro reflection, but uh, n I mean, somewhat similar to what you get in a superconductor. Uh, you shoot particle in a superconductor, you get a hole back reflected, uh, like an Andrea process, but uh, there are also many other classical examples of the same kind, corner, corner reflectors of various kinds that we use in protective clothing uh, or uh, the famous uh, red eye, or in this case, cat, uh, cat eye phenomenon, uh, arising in the same way because of light back reflected from the, uh, from the, uh, from the eye, uh, from the sphere in your eye, right? So, so this is a classical back reflection, and in, in, my, in my case, the Fermi surface provides uh, a substitute, or acts in the same way as, as, um, <coughs> as these classical objects do, and uh, combination of momentum conservation and, and power blocking uh, generates a back reflected hole. Uh, in, um, in, and so, so I think this analogy is quite, quite good. Um, a, a, any questions on that? <coughs> okay, so I think I have time for just one more topic I have to maybe make a choice. Um, uh, yeah, let me let me talk talk about this anyway. I mean, uh, th there is a there is a way to calculate conductivity and other response functions in a more general way, not specializing to that thermographic regime, but you know, just starting starting more generally uh, in um, you know by by linearizing transport equations and uh, and then deriving uh, deriving expressions for all transport coefficients in terms of continued fractions. And so this is pretty interesting, and that, that's how it goes. You, you can take, again, so you start with linearized transport equation, and then 
expand your distribution function in harmonics in angles and then uh, and then plug it in and then write this equation in the angular harmonic basis uh, and uh, in this basis by uh, after some simple algebra you get a tri tri diagonal matrix that harmonics number m coupled with harmonic number m plus one and m minus one and the couplings depend on the wave number uh, so if, if you are in a uniform system then harmonics are decoupled and they relax uh, in independently but in in, in a non-uniform state, uh, they are coupled and, and couplings are proportional to, to, to wave number and, uh, and then you get a tridiagonal matrix. And then if you, if you add electric field to that, you get, you get s source terms uh, with M equal plus one and minus one because uh, electric field couples to harmonics of current, uh, which, are, which are plus and minus one harmonics, right? And so, so now if, if you want to calculate conductivity or viscosity, you just need to invert invert a tridiagonal matrix uh, and uh, inverting a tridiagonal matrix leads quite naturally to continued fractions uh, and uh, the express, yeah. Is this like the equivalent of the two dimensional two D? Two D, two D. Uh, 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 <coughs> I mean, um, I suppose it could be done, but I don't, I mean, uh, the general structure is going to be the same because of the angular momentum addition couples L and L, L, and L plus one and L minus one, uh, but uh, I don't think people try to do, I mean, maybe Dmitry knows because he, he wrote something like that on, also on 2D, but, but, but um, so, so I haven't seen anything on 3D, but, but I'm, I'm not clear, actually now that you said yeah, maybe I've seen something. I, I will remember later. Um, yeah, so, 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 so this is, um, uh, I mean, if you invert tridiagonal matrix and then calculate response of current uh, to electric field, then you get, uh, then you get an expression that looks uh, uh, painfully familiar. It looks like Druda conductivity, and the only difference is that gamma in the denominator is a function of k now, the wave number. And, uh, and that function of k is uh, a sum, is a continued fraction with these gammas, uh, the angular momentum relaxation rate coming in all, all together, even an odd. And for generality, I allowed also the m equal one uh, angular momentum relaxation. Uh, so so with, this, with this expression, you can analyze all possible limits. So for example, if you, uh, the simplest one, uh, if you have a uniform state, then k, electric field is uniform, k is equal to zero, uh, then you can forget about, can forget about this part, uh, then only this part survives and you get the familiar Druda, Druda formula. On the other hand, if, if um, momentum relaxation does not happen, uh, you phonons, no phonons, no disorder, then gamma one will be zero and then only this part will survive. Um, and then here, if you, again, if you go to very small k, you see that you cannot really take limit of k going to zero. Uh, but if you take k to be very, very small, then you can drop all the, all the high order parts of that, uh, of that continued fraction and you're, you're only left with this, this part. And so that, th that will correspond to the Stokes limit uh, that we talked about yesterday if you start with, um, So this equation that was here yesterday, gamma electron phonon plus mu Laplacian times velocity equal rho m times electric field. Um, so if you invert that and then, uh, then you get conductivity that behaves like one over gamma electron phonon plus, uh, plus uh, mu, um, k square, uh, mu is the viscosity. So, so if that is zero, you get conductivity, which is one over k square. And th th that's the non-local conductivity that you have on the navier stokes limit um, and um, in, in the hydrodynamic limit. And th th that's what this predicts in the limit of small k's. But, but small k's correspond to, uh, to, to very large line scales where all, all these memory effects due to directional memory are gone. And if you want to understand the tomographic regime, you have to work uh, in between. So you have, to, you have to analyze the entire continued fraction and then analyzing that continued fraction 
uh, you can get the power laws that uh, that um, power laws that uh, that uh, that we talked about. Uh, so that okay. So that that's what was just said, and then uh, then then you get this expression with mu being a function of k, as uh, as we mentioned earlier, and this function of k is explicitly given by by this relation, and you can work on that to extract the power laws, and they are identical to the power laws that we d just discussed, right? So, so the consequences of that, I mean, there are may many different uh, consequences, but one, one interesting uh, thing one can ask is how is w what will be the change of the profile, let's say, of a fluid flowing in a, in a confined geometry. Let's say you, uh, we know that if, if a fluid flows in a, in a pipe, then there will be a parabolic Poise, Poise profile. And if you do the same, same analysis here, you find that, uh, that because, because viscosity now a power law function of length scale, uh, the current profile instead of parabolic becomes a fractional, fractional uh, power law. It will be c something close to two thirds power of Poise, uh, Poise flow. Uh, and um, likewise, conductivity will be scale dependent, and it will be there will be new, new scaling exponents arising for all, all transfer coefficients. Uh, so, so, if you, in particular, for 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 conductivity, if you com uh, sorry for uh, viscous flow, if you compare to compare to Poise flow, uh, where <coughs> velocity profile is parabolic, uh, here it will be two thirds of that. So it will be something very close to a semicircle. Uh, not exactly a semicircle, but pretty close to a semicircle. <laughs> uh, and um, that's, uh, th that's a clear prediction of that tomographic regime, and you know, people are now measuring it using scanning probes and you know, we'll, uh, we'll, um, we'll hopefully we'll, we'll find out soon. Right, so okay, so I think this is all kind of optional. Let me skip that. Uh, Maybe, um, yeah, I think time is up. Maybe l let's leave five minutes for questions and the rest we can discuss privately. <laughs>